Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn about the psychology of money, finessing financial security. My first guest is Michelle Singletary. She is a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, and her award-winning column, The Color of Money, appears twice a week in dozens of newspapers across the country. She is a frequent contributor to NPR and regularly appears on CNN's weekend editions of New Day, CNN Newsroom, and The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. In 2020, the Washington Post celebrated her long and distinguished career at the paper with the Eugene Meyer Award, its highest journalistic honor. Single Terry earned a master's degree in business and management from Johns Hopkins University. Currently, she lives in Maryland with her family, and she's in the house to help us out with some financial first aid. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Me too. You know, oftentimes, you know, people say, you know, the old adage, money can't buy happiness, but we know from all the research that that's not exactly true. That's true. I mean, the thing is, what people are trying to say with some of the studies is that an abundance of money doesn't make you more happy, but there is a minimum amount that you need to live and to achieve some level of happiness and security. Really, that's what it's about. Happiness equals security or security equals happiness. And I think it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You know, when our base is secure, we have the ability to become self-actualized, to do the work that gives us meaning. But when we're just struggling for survival, we're in panic mode. That's exactly right. And if we don't have that baseline, we tend to make decisions that are not in our best interest in terms of making us happy. For example, you know, you may stay in a job longer because you haven't handled your money well and you're making really good money, but the job is making you miserable. So the answer isn't to continue in that miserable job. The answer is to figure out how to handle your money better with whatever you've got and then pursue something something that's going to make you secure and happy. Amen to that. Let's talk about the times in which we're living right now. We are coming out of, or some might say we're still in the midst of the pandemic. So many people have been financially affected by this. Jobs have been eliminated. People are out of work. And there is fear in the air. And I think rightfully so. It definitely is. You know, the thing is, the uh, economists talk about it as like a K-shaped economy, so uh, a recovery. So if you think about a K, that that line that goes up, that's uh, quite a few Americans who kept their job, was able actually to save during the pandemic. And then the bottom line that's going down represents a lot of low-income families, people of color um, who were already struggling. And, you know, they were already at the mountaintop perch to to go over and this pandemic just pushed them over the edge. So what kind of strategies or tips can you give people who may be struggling who say, you want me to save? You want me to strategize when all I'm trying to do is put food on the table? So, you know, I, I approach it like you would if you're going to an emergency room. And so if you've ever been to a hospital emergency room, like say you sprain your ankle and you're sitting there for hours and hours and you're thinking, when are they going to see me? And then someone comes in after you and they take them back right away. And you're, you know, you're ticked off. You're like, wait a minute, I've been waiting here forever. (laughs) 
But what you don't know is that the staff has triaged that emergency room. So they're taking back people who are in critical condition. So that person who came in, they were having a heart attack. And while your sprained ankle is definitely something that needs to be taken care of, not before someone is having a heart attack. You have to think of your finances as that along the same way. So if you are in a situation where you're critical, you aren't making enough, you've lost your job, and you can only have enough, if that, to put a roof over your head and fool to the table where well, you're going to take back and you're going to be okay and don't feel guilty about that. You take care of the baselines. That means you're not going to pay your credit card debt. You're not going to pay that those other loans and bills that don't mean as more as making sure you've got security for you, yourself and your family. But a lot of people, because we drum it into them, pay your bills, pay them on time, no matter what. So then when a crisis hits, people try to take that little bit of money and spread it across everything. When you can't do that, you've got to be that heart patient in that emergency room and just take care of what is absolutely necessary for your household. This is great advice that we must triage our fiscal responsibilities. And you talk in your book, What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits, about the bills that need to be paid first. And you talked about just now bypassing those credit cards for the short term. That's right. You know, you you pay you pay absolutely what you have, and in some cases, you even if you've lost your job and there's just nothing there, you might actually not pay your rent on your mortgage. I mean, in most areas, it's going to take a little while before you're evicted. Now, I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying at this moment, this day, if you've only got fifty dollars or a hundred dollars or maybe five hundred dollars, you you the the primary. Uh, thing that you're going to focus on is food. You know, the things that keep you um, alive, really. Um, and then, you know, the next thing would be housing and trying to make sure you pay those those rent payments. But so many people focus so much on their credit because, again, we've drummed into people that you are a failure if you've got a bad credit score. And so what I find is that people are like, well, I'm just going to pay a little bit on this credit card. But no, honey, you can't do that right now while you don't have an income or your income has been disrupted. Now, what you do should do is call your lenders and say, I'm in a bad way. I need a pause in my payment. Can you give me this relief? And most will. Some won't, but if they won't, you know what? That's okay. They're going to sit in that waiting room with their sprained ankle while you take care of what you need to take care of. (laughs) <laughs> very well put. You know, it, it, it's very interesting because when we're in this panic mode, it's very hard to see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It is because we've made we put the onus on individuals so much when it comes to personal finance. Now I'm a woman of personal responsibility. I, you know, pay your bills, pay them on time, all that kind of things. But a lot of the, what we teach doesn't give any room for when life happens, and so we have to let people off the hook when life happens. There's no. Lots of people lost their job through no fault of their own. Yeah. There was a little virus that came away and knocked, you know, a lot of people off their feet. And so because we have drummed it into them that you are a financial failure if you don't do this, this, and that, that they then don't do the things that they need to do to write themselves up. Now's the not the time to worry about your credit score. Your credit score can be built back up once you get back on your feet. What you are sharing makes such good sense. And it's almost like coaching someone through this crisis, not just for finances, but just for their emotional survival. That's right. That's right. You know, losing your job and losing the ability to uh, uh, to take care of yourself is, is not unlike losing a loss, a loved one. Now, I know that analogy seems so so stark, but there's a phase of grief that you go through when you lose someone. Uh, and for many people, losing their livelihood feels like a financial death, right? And so we don't allow people to grieve. You know, we don't allow them to go through the stages of feeling like they did something or they should have done something else. Now, 
clearly there's some people who don't manage their money well and they know who they are. But even in this moment, if that was you, you still don't have to beat yourself up because I'm sure if you knew better, you would have done better. So a lot of people don't know how to handle their finances. They're good at whatever they do. But when it comes to this money thing, it's pretty hard for a lot of people. So I want you to, I want to give people permission to grieve when financial issues happen happen in their life. But just like when you grieve a lost one, at some point you've got to work through the process to get healed again. And that's the same thing with your money. Work through the process to get healed. Do what you have to do right now. Some bills aren't going to get paid. Once you get back working or you're able to stable yourself, then you can work on building your credit score back up. Then you can work on building savings up. It is at that point you're in the position where you can help yourself better. And for those who have lost jobs and are in the midst of their own financial crisis, and maybe they're looking for work, I do think, and tell me what you think about this, that this is also a very fertile time to create new businesses, new industries that capitalize on what has just happened to the world. I think it is. I think if you've got some background that you perhaps could start a business, maybe you were, you know, an educator and the school shut down. I didn't need as many people, but maybe you go into tutoring or, you know, helping people prepare for the SAT or, you know, I just actually, uh, my neighbor is an educator and my daughter is studying to be a teacher. And he and I just had a conversation that I was telling her she's having trouble finding a summer internship. And I said to him, I said, you know what? She should probably contact some of those parents from the schools who've been struggling to get their kids to to be to do online learning and start a little tutoring job for the summer to help them you know catch up so when the school starts in the fall they'll still be on track so it's definitely a time to be creative I will say this though you need to be very careful and understand what it means to be a business owner and do your due diligence do all the homework to make sure that if that is a path that you want to pursue that you don't get yourself into more trouble trying to start a business like taking out a lot of loans and and not really understanding what you need to do. There's some people who were built to be business owners and some people who maybe this is an opportunity to maybe switch careers or switch a a work path rather than maybe starting a business. We're going to take that break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation with my guest today, Michelle Singletary. She is the author of What to Do with Your Money When Crisis Hits, Your Emergency Go-To Survival Guide When finances get tight. To learn more, please visit michellesingletary.com, on Twitter at Singletary M, and on Facebook, that handle is at Michelle Singletary, and on Instagram, Singletary M. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back, and that is a promise. Wait, wait, wait. Before we take that break, let's talk about the power of protein for our well-being. I'm a big fan of protein smoothies to support my super active lifestyle, and that's why I'm proud to partner with Ritual, today's episode sponsor. Protein helps us build strong muscles, supports bone health, and helps us feel full after eating. Ritual scientist and nutritionist recommended essential protein is a delicious, plant-based protein powder. Ritual offers three thoughtful formulas, each packed with 20 grams of sustainably sourced pea protein designed to meet our body's evolving protein needs. I love Ritual because it's a tasty, quick, and easy routine that helps me get essential nutrients on the go. And Ritual helps me keep all the bad stuff out. It's vegan, gluten and allergen free and free from fillers, colors, and additives. My go-to formula is the Daily Shake for 50 Plus that adds calcium HMB to the mix to help maintain muscle mass and promote healthy aging. Make Ritual part of your lifestyle management routine. Your body will thank you. Ready to shake up your protein ritual? My listeners get 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash harvesting. Ritual even offers a money-back guarantee if you're not 100% in love. Visit ritual.com slash harvesting today for 10% off your first three months. Now let's take that pause. We'll be right back. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit harvestinghappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And 
And we're back. But before we rejoin the conversation, let's talk about the ease, efficiency, and cost savings of having your favorite high-quality grocery items delivered right to your doorstep. Between producing this show, running my practice, and traveling for work, I'm always short on time. And that's why I'm a member of Thrive Market, where I get top-notch, carefully vetted provisions. That means everything from healthy pantry essentials to sustainable meat and seafood to non-toxic cleaning and beauty products shipped to my front door. Thrive Market is serious about providing great value and price matches its products. If you find a lower price anywhere, Thrive Market will meet it. Finding everything you need on Thrive Market is a snap because you can filter your wants and needs by values and lifestyles to find what works best for you and your family. Shop by what you eat and what matters most to you. Thrive Market offers more than 5,000 products to choose from to help keep your family and home well nourished. My recent Recent order included Thrive Market's wild caught Alaskan sockeye salmon and organic balsamic glaze. Whether your lifestyle is plant based, keto, gluten free, zero waste, or BIPOC owned brands, Thrive Market has got you covered. And when you join Thrive Market, you're joining me and a community of more than 1 million members strong in paying it forward to sponsor other families in need. Let's not forget about their fast and carbon neutral shipping that is also helping to better our one precious planet. Can your grocery store do that? Join Thrive Market today to get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash harvesting to get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50. That's thrivemarket.com slash harvesting, thrivemarket.com slash harvesting. Now let's get back to it. And we're back, continuing the conversation with Michelle Singletary. We're talking about the psychology of money, finessing financial security. Let's get back to it. So, Michelle, prior to the break, we were talking about, you know, how to take care of ourselves when financial crisis hits. I want to turn the topic a little bit to savings because this is a dicey thing for many of us. How to save, when to save, how to dip into savings when crisis does come about. It definitely is. You know, the Federal Reserve looked at how people handle their money and found that a great amount of people don't have enough money to weather a $400 financial emergency. Yeah. So in other words, if something happens, they, they can't even come up with a $400. Other studies have shown, you know, people don't have, you know, $1,000. So, you know, like your car breaks down. Why is it when your car breaks down? It's always like $1,200. Always. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like they've got some sort of cheat sheet behind there that says charge everybody this no matter what. And so, but it makes sense, right? If people are living paycheck to paycheck, they haven't been able to carve out any money to put aside for a financial emergency. But the thing is, you've got to do that, even if it's just $25. And so what I tell people is that there really ought to be two pots of of rainy day money. So the classic emergency fund, and I call that really the dire fund. That's if you've lost your job. And the goal is to build up at least three to six months of what it takes to run your household on a monthly basis. Now, for many people, that's a a lot of money. So if you're in debt or you're living paycheck to paycheck, don't worry about that three to six months, at least try to get maybe half a month or a month's worth, um, especially if you have debt. But if you can reach that goal, so that's one pot of money. Once you hit that goal, you set it aside, you set it and forget it. But then you need what I consider a life happens fund. So that's different from the emergency fund. That life happens for when life happens. Your car breaks down. If you've got kids, they're going to break something in your house. They're going to stuff something in their dishwasher. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's things happen. Your kid comes home and says, you know, we're taking a school trip. It's $50. The things that you haven't planned for, but that are not dire situations. So the reason why people don't have an emergency fund is because the emergency fund becomes that slush fund. Money slushes in, money slushes out. Well, the life 
happens fund prevents that bleeding of the emergency fund. So that fund, you're going to have, you know, anywhere from 500 to maybe a thousand dollars. If you're a higher net in with uh, individual, you're going to err on the side of more rather than less, like 2000, 3000, 4000, maybe even $5,000. You can keep your vacation money in there. You can keep all the money that things that just normal happens in life. Now, the money that goes in there is going to come in. It's going to come out. That's perfectly fine. If you need to use it for a $1,200 car repair, and as soon as you can, you build that fund back up. And so that's that's the pot that you're going to pull in. Now, both of these are just going to be put in a simple bank account. You're not going to invest this money. You're not even going to worry that it's not earning anything because that's not the job yeah. of those two pots. Yeah, not the not the point of that money. How do we cut back? Let's say we really are committed to these two savings accounts and maybe even want to start to invest a little bit, you know? How do we cut back in ways that are palatable to ourselves where we don't feel like we're really suffering or denying ourselves? So I'm going to say this, even though this is a happiness podcast. Yeah, go ahead. It's it's okay. Probably, you know, I want you to suffer. I want (laughs) you to suffer. I, you know, I'm just not going to run away from that. You know, um, we can't have it all. And, and lots of financial people say, oh, you know, you could, you know, save and give yourself a little treat. No, don't treat yourself to nothing. I want you to know what it's like to live without. Because in those times where you need that money, you're going to wish that you had suffered. So that could mean that you may go a couple years without taking a vacation in which you have to put out a lot of money. You can still vacation. You just have to have a stay vacation. Yeah, you it's can staycation. That, that staycation, that's exactly right. If you live in an area where you can walk to a lake or a pond or a park, or you know what? Just walk down your street and look up at the sky. I walk my dog. My husband and I have a rotation schedule. So I walk my dog on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And it is the most enjoyable time, especially when the skies are clear, even if there's some clouds. And I just walk and look up at the sky. And I'm telling you, it is so serene and beautiful. There's nobody else around. It's just him and I, and he's sniffing the grass. And I'm just just peaceful. I'm not listening to any music. I try not to worry about anything. And it is as nice as taking a vacation. Well, maybe not taking a vacation to Hawaii, but close. <laughs> you know? And so, so when I say suffer, so that means that you got to comb through your budget and cut out anything that is not a necessity. You got four streaming accounts, so really none, because a lot of things you can watch online now. You can listen to podcasts, you know? So I need you to, for a season of time, to suffer in the sense of cut out everything that's not a necessity, to build that emergency or those emergency pots. And once you do that, and then once you get rid of any unnecessary debt, then you can go back to having those things that make you happy, like taking a vacation. Oh, well, you went wide with that. I was thinking about just sort of the, the, the daily coffee, like many of us are spending, you know, five, six dollars a day just on coffee. And that's one way to just jumpstart the, the savings account. It is one way, but I think we overemphasize the fact that if you cut out that coffee, somehow you're going to become a millionaire. Well, that's, that's never going to happen. You know, that's <laughs> never going to happen. That's never going to happen. And that's never going to happen. And so what I want you to do actually is concentrate on the big things. There's the two big things that people spend so much money on in their budget is a housing. And so you're like, well, wait a minute, Michelle, what do, how can people do that? So we in this country have, have, have drilled it into people that if you don't have your own place, you're a financial failure. And so we have people who have apartments by themselves and houses about themselves. We don't encourage multi-generational housing. We don't encourage people to have, you know, you know, two and three roommates, you know, it's like, that's only for college. No, especially if you live in high cost areas, you need to team up. If you're a single mom, team up with another single mom and rent a townhouse together. If you are able to, when you come out of college, go, go, go back and live home with your parents. And I'm telling you, live home until you're in your thirties. <laughs> oh my I'm God. Serious about that. You know, because, you know, my, my, we, my husband, and I have three children in their 
married, early 20s. And our oldest is Spanish undergrad. She's Spanish master's. And we begged her, begged her to move back home and live with us. And I'm trying to get it till at least 30 because we told her, if you take your entire, pretty much your entire paycheck, about 95% for those five or six or even seven years. When she launches, if she saved all that money, she could buy her home outright or close to it. And if yeah. in her mid-30s, she can be mortgage-free, that is a financial game changer for the rest of her life. Yeah, I see where you're going with this now. And I'm with you. I'm back on the page with you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Same thing with the second largest item on your budget is your transportation. We go from car loan to car loan to car loan to car loan. Over a lifetime, individuals spend about $200,000 on car loans. But if you keep that car for 10 or 15 years, maintaining it, and then never get another car loan because you've saved up that money for those 10 or 15 years and you can buy your car with cash, that's money that you can invest for your retirement so that you can retire early and be happy. Oh, I hear you. So let's talk about investment and the stock market and how to keep ourselves from panicking with the roller coaster that the stock market just does doing what it does. Yeah, you know, you know, I again, you know, I'm a contrarian, so I'm gonna say this. I go ahead and panic. Go ahead and scream. Ah when the market goes crazy. Go ahead and do it. Because to tell people not to, it's against human nature. I'm a very good saver. I'm a very good money manager. Done really well with my retirement accounts. And I have non-retirement investment accounts done completely well. But when that market last uh, 2020 in March tanked and tanked tragically, you know, I screamed, I yelled, I ran into my husband's office and I go, oh, baby, we done lost some money. And he says, well, um, don't you? Um, kind of do this for a living. And so like, why are you screaming? But you can scream. But the thing is, don't act on that panic. Yeah. That is the difference. Because we know over time, the market corrects itself. It may not do that this year or next year. It may take two years, but on average, it's about two years for it to correct itself. So if you scream, ah, but don't act on that, then you will be okay. Because here's the thing about investing. The number one reason to invest is to make sure that you keep pace with inflation or more. So the things that you buy tomorrow, today, you've got to buy tomorrow and you've got to make sure that your money grows that way. It's not going to do that in a simple savings account. It's not going to do that in your mattress. And if it does, if you want to put your money in your mattress, just let me know where you live. You know? <laughs> Yeah, we'll both come over. <laughs> we'll both come over. So scream if you have to. Don't act on that. I think that's really good advice. I think, you know, the, the, the ability to just be patient and hold on and see that all things are impermanent. You know, the, the, the rise and fall of the market, that's the only guarantee, right? It's going to go that's up. It's going to go down. And if we can hang tight in there, it's, it's going to turn out. That's right. And if you're closer to retirement, then you got to make sure you have a good plan in place. So you don't want to, you want to have about two years worth of living expenses, either in your savings accounts or through a pension or an annuity. So that money that you're going to use while you wait for the market to correct itself. So yeah. at least two years. So you don't want all of your money exposed to the market. You want to pull some back. If, if you're really conservative, you can have two to five years. And then after that, let the rest of that money roll. Because here's the thing, we're living longer. And so when you retire, say at 60, you could have another 20, 30, or 40 oh, years yeah. of retirement. Yeah. And that money has to grow. And so you can let that money grow while you have savings to take care of your daily, uh, you know, rent and, and, and food and things like that. And that's how you can scream, but not panic. Oh, I, I, I like what you're saying, because you're really saying you, you embrace the fear and, and then deal with it. 
you know, That's- so it's kind of no nonsense. This is this is life, you know, pull up your pants and get on with it. I, I really right. like that. Yeah, because people try to time the market. They say, well, I'm getting out now that it's bad. And then they're going to try to get back in. But the problem with that is you've got to know when to get out and when to get in. And not even the professionals know how to do that. No, they don't. They don't. Your dog is probably be- a better um, fortune teller than, than the professionals. He sure is. He knows when it's going to rain. And so. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, thanks for hanging out with me today. This book is great because there are many of us living with these conditions right now of fear and uncertainty and trying to be fiscally responsible and fiscally strong. So if you need some financial first aid, go out and get the book. What to do with your money when crisis hits, your emergency go-to survival guide when finances get tight. Written by my guest today, Michelle Singletary. To learn more about Michelle's work, please visit michellesingletary.com, on Twitter at Singletary M, on Facebook, Michelle Singletary, and on Instagram, Singletary M. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, well, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. And we're back continuing exploring the psychology of money, finessing financial security. My next guest is Scott Nations. He is the president of Nation Shares, a financial firm that specializes in market volatility analysis. He was a regular contributor at CNBC, where he discussed markets and other investment topics. Scott is the author of A History of the United States in Five Crashes, as well as two technical books for option traders, Options Math, and The Complete Book of Options Spreads and Combinations. Scott is based in Chicago, and he's here to talk about his latest book, The Anxious Investor, Mastering the Mental Game of Investing. Scott, I'm one of those anxious investors. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Lisa, it's so easy to be anxious today, but thanks for having me. (laughs) It is, it is. Let's talk a little bit about the very human nature of us humans and how we behave with investment, which which is a little bit like kind of gambling. Well, unfortunately, we make that analogy and I tend to do that as well. It's not a very good analogy because we we gamble for entertainment and we invest. And Lisa, investing is a really noble exercise. We're deferring enjoyment or compensation now uh, so that we can make tomorrow better for ourselves or our families. And so it's easy to be anxious about it. And the goal of the book is to help people understand some of the behavioral biases that we all display, we all display, uh, to help them understand them a little bit and do it in a really non-threatening way. Rather than lecturing, I tell three, I think, really interesting narratives. And I, I talk about 15 different behavioral biases in the context of those narratives. And the goal is for people to say, oh, yeah, well, not that bias, not so much for me. And that bias, not so much for me. But, oh, this one. Yeah, I fall prey to that. And so I'm going to be careful next time I'm making some investment decisions. Because, Lisa, unfortunately, of all the biases that I discuss, none of them, not a single one, helps our investment returns. All of them are bad for our investment returns. Well, let's talk a little bit about those three types, because I, I've got a picture in my mind of what I think they are, but I, I have a feeling you're going to prove me wrong. Well, I, I actually talk about, again, 15 different biases, and they're biases that we all fall prey to. And to your point, it's because we're human. And so to a certain degree, we have to kind of change the way we, we approach investing. Uh, and it's, as you point out, investing success is, is important for happiness and well-being. Uh, But we have to kind of trick our minds a little bit or understand how our minds think. As an example, it's easy for investors to think that the sorts of things they can remember should drive investing decisions. And we may not remember, but we've all heard of, say, the crash of 1929 or the crash of 1987 or what happened in 2008 and 2009 or what happened immediately after COVID broke out. We, We can remember those things. Unfortunately, that's that's not a good thesis for 
an investment strategy. And so I point out that if you can remember a specific thing that happened in the market, then it's certainly not normal. And it's probably not <laughs> the way you want to structure your investments. Well, we talk about the types of investors, right? That's what I was thinking of. M more of the image that comes to mind is sort of the cowboy gambler, the one who's really, you know, taking a lot of risks, somebody who's, you know, somewhere in the middle, a bit conservative. And then there are those who are completely risk adverse and just want that sure bet. And all three are strategies, but I don't think they're really working well for what you're trying to communicate in your book. No, I, the, the book is intended for the average investor who unfortunately is a little bit anxious. And you're right. There are, there are many people who are, who are just, they, they hate risk so much that they refuse to take any. But Lisa, that makes it really, really difficult in this day and age to save effectively for retirement yeah. or a college education. No growth. Given that for, <laughs> yeah, for all of us, it's, it's on us now. And then also, if you're taking a bunch of risk and jumping in and out of the market, that's not productive or successful either. So, you know, people ask me now that I've written the book, they ask, you know, what is your, your advice? And my advice to, to every investor would be invest, continue investing, don't stop investing, and don't think that you can jump in and out of the market effectively. So even though it's going to look bad at times, continue to invest because the market will do all of the work you need it to do when it comes to compounding your savings. And when we talk about the sort of behavioral psychology of investing, I think it's really important to talk about how as human, we are pleasure seeking missiles. We're constantly <laughs> wanting a hit of dopamine. We want that pleasure, that feeling, that swirl that you refer to. And talk about how, if you will, about how learning to manage that desire and that impulse control is really important. Lisa, the point of the book was to talk about the behavioral biases, but again, show them in kind of a non-threatening, non-lecturing way and help people understand, but then prove that they exist and quantify their existence. And, and there are a couple that feed into this sensation seeking that we all fall prey to. One is uh, people, investors, like to sell their profitable investments. And it's because it's not because we're being disciplined and refuse to be greedy. There's a lot of research that shows that it's actually a suboptimal investment strategy. We are greedy instead for, as you pointed out, the swirl of chemicals that is unleashed in our brain when we actually realize a profit, when we sell something for a profit, whether it's dopamine or all the other brain chemicals that are at work. We're actually being greedy when we do that. And, you know, there are other sensation seeking. Investing shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be an ordeal. But on the other hand, we shouldn't be doing it for entertainment or sensation seeking either, because as I show in the book, that doesn't work out either. Talk a little bit about how you would counsel, let's say, a young person just graduating from college, and I'm thinking of my son, actually, who's got a few pennies that he's saved, and he's starting out with his investment strategy. Take us through a scenario that could work for somebody like him or people in that category. Well, congratulations. <laughs> the first thing I would say is to him is invest and continue to invest. Keep investing. Don't stop investing and don't think you can jump in and out of the market. The second thing that I would say to him is uh, pay attention to your time frame. Are you trying to invest this money so you can, you can buy a home in five years? Or are, is this truly long term? Are you thinking that this is actually the, the core of a retirement strategy? And then invest the money in a way that is sympathetic to that goal. One of the things I talk about in the book is we all want to and see how we're doing. And then, Lisa, we end up investing as if we have a one-year time frame. And there, again, there's a bunch of research, some from a Nobel Prize winner, that shows that even if we're not going to use the money in 30 years, we tend to deploy it as if we're going to use it in about one year. And that's because <laughs> we tend to look at our results on kind of an annual basis. And so to your son, I would say, figure out what your time frame really is and then invest in a way that's appropriate for that. The only other thing I would say is there are wonderful, wonderful, low-cost investment options that you have now and take advantage of those. 
That's true. I mean, the democracy of investing today is pretty plentiful. We have a lot of options. And I think that's the cool thing, you know, is is getting young people interested in investment. And typically, in the past, women have been sort of slower to come to the table as their own investors. And that's unfortunate, because we know that they're going to tend to, to outlive us. One of the biases I do talk about is overconfidence. And um, again, there's a bunch of research, and we quantify the fact that when it comes to investing, or at least trading, men are more overconfident than women. And there's, again, there's data to quantify that. And single men are much more overconfident than the rest of men in general. <laughs> and, and, and overconfidence never works out very well as an investor. Yeah, you, you, make, you make a very good point there. I want to talk a little bit about loss, because nobody likes losing. And, and yet, I can speak from my own investment experience that there are times when I have lost in the market, and I'm okay with it. But people around me are like, Oh, my God, you've lost. That's not good. Talk a little bit about maybe putting aside the fear or aversion of, of loss in, this, in the, the bigger picture. We all fall prey to this. We see that we've lost money and we hate that. Now, it's fine to not like losing, but, and I'll get back to something specific in a bit. But again, over time, over time, the stock market will do all the work you need it to do when it comes to compounding your savings. The specific thing I want to talk about is another one of the biases I discuss in the book. It's called loss aversion. And Lisa, we think about this, we hear this, we think, oh, yeah, it's, that's perfectly reasonable, reasonable to be averse to loss. Yeah. That's normal. That's, we hate losing. <laughs> We're humans. That's, and, and that's fine. The problem is that investors hate losses about twice as much as they like commensurate profit. And so the fact that we hate losses so much more than we like profits leads us to do some goofy things. For example, we get to the point where the markets fall on a bunch and we just can't take it anymore. We physic we think we physically can't take it anymore and we end up selling at the very bottom. Yeah. And there's a bunch of research that shows that a lot of investors did that in 2009. And the problem is you miss out on a big bounce and then you don't get back into the market until it's gone come a long way back. And so loss aversion is really normal. But the degree to which we hate losses more than we like profits often twists or perverts our approach to, to investing. It makes me think of a story during the onset of COVID. I had a relative that had bought a significant amount of stock in travel companies <laughs> and was pretty upset, <laughs> understandably. It was like, oh, my God, I just threw a chunk into this. And, you know, we talked about sort of the pent up demand that it was going to come back, it was going to be fine. And he's in finance, this person, but it, it was like biting the bullet, like he, he, he knew intellectually, it would be okay. But yet, like, his nerves just couldn't take it. But he was able to ride it out, I, I might add. And may have had the good fortune of having been in finance. So he was used to the roller coaster. Yes. To the average investor who's not in finance. And doesn't want to be subject to that roller coaster. That's why I give just the, the, the advice that I do, and that is invest, continue to invest, invest in some sort of broad-based product, uh, maybe the entire U.S. stock market. There are plenty of products that will do that, or the S&P 500, and really low-cost products. So don't outthink yourself, and don't think you're smarter than the market, because we know that that's not the case. Let's take a pause. We'll be right back to learn more about Scott Nations and his book, The Anxious Investor, Mastering the Mental Game of Investing. Please visit scottnations.com and on Twitter at Scott Nations. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. 
Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. We're back talking with Scott Nations about the psychology of money, finessing financial security. Let's get back to the conversation with Scott. So, Scott, we're talking about financial finesse, securing your wealth and your future. Let's get back to your book and talking about herd mentality, you know, or being being one of the sheep in the flock and how that doesn't necessarily serve us. No, in fact, while it's really comforting, it is horrible, again, as an investment thesis. And, you know, Lisa, in the book, I talk about, you know, three famous bubbles and subsequent crashes. And the goal, again, the goal of the narrative is to show through history how investors have fallen prey to some of these biases. And one of them is hurting. And I talk about hurting in the context of what happened in the internet bubble. Uh, it's easy for an investor, particularly when they're confused. Actually, it's easy for a human. <laughs> particularly when they're confused, to look around and see what other people are doing and just mimic them. And so you go with the herd. You think they know what they're doing. I don't. I'm going to follow them. Or you think they've done the research. They understand all of these internet companies that didn't exist three years ago. I'm going to follow them. So I'm going to buy a bunch of internet companies in 1999. I'm going to buy pets.com and and all the other ones. And the problem is that um, the herd is no more smarter than, than you. You may think they are, but they're no more smarter than you. And so you end up joining the herd. Unfortunately, you buy at the top. And then it's only after the herd is turned around and is going the other way that you realize things are not working out. And then... Because the herd is now fleeing, you sell at the bottom. And yeah. so part of the problem, Lisa, is that uh, if that's your investment thesis, then you really only have the tools that the herd is using. And so you end up buying at the top, you buy the wrong stuff at the top, you sell at the bottom, and just mimicking the herd uh, doesn't work out. And anybody who's been in high school and done something stupid just to go along with the crowd will recognize that. Yes, the walk of shame. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about how, I mean, there are more questions I have regarding your book, but I want to just ask you to share a strategy. Like I was always told that if you're looking for places to invest, look to what you love or look to what you know or what you're interested in and see a bigger picture. You know, like I'm really interested in in the solar car that's coming out, you know, without naming names, there's one coming out. I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put a little money behind that. Is this something that you recommend? It's, you know, it's, it's an interesting way to get people and keep people involved in their investments and in the stock market. And to the degree that you put a, a small amount of money in, in order to, in, to remain engaged then it might be a good strategy. But we also know that people don't do a good job of diversifying. The average investor has too much money invested in companies that are headquartered near where they live. Uh -huh. Why? Because they're simply available to, to thinking or memory. And they have too much money invested in the industry in which they work for the same reason. Familiarity. And that, I mean, that's the opposite of diversification. Let's think, if you live in a small town, say a company town, then having all your money invested with that in that company is probably not a good idea. If the company does well, you're going to do well anyway. So that sort of thing can be helpful, again, as long as it, it continues to get you engaged. There's quickly also, I'll try to be very quick with this. There was also something that happened uh, during the internet bubble. And Pete, that is people fell in love with some of the iconoclastic founders of these businesses. And they invested in these companies, not because the company was a great investment necessarily, or because they, the, the fundamentals of the business made so much sense, but because they were just enraptured by the personality that was leading it. Mm. Uh, and I talk about this in the, in the book, some researchers call these fantastic objects. And that's also, <laughs> a, it's, that's very human, 
but it's also probably not the best way to invest your money. Let's talk a little bit about what you call availability bias. Right. It, it, there are really several things at work here, but and this is one of the, the areas where all, a number of the biases kind of uh, come together. But as I mentioned before, if you can call something to mind, something specific to mind, then it is almost certainly not normal or average. And as such, it's probably not a good way to deploy your money. Again, as I was just starting my career in 1987 when the stock market crashed in October 19th. And so that's actually, that's fundamental for me. I can, I can tell you almost exactly the, everything I did that day and the next day. But that's a horrible way to invest. And so um, in the book, I, I, I describe what is normal, what is average, and say this is actually a better way to build some sort of investment structure. So availability plays tricks on us. It makes us think that extreme events are more likely than they are. And that means that our investment strategy is probably not everything it might be. And it also limits the number of investment options you might have. As an example, oddly, there are 505 stocks in the S&P 500. And I ask people, how many of those do you think you could name? And the average person who's not in finance would probably do well to mention, to be able to call to mind 200 of them. Those are the 200 that are available to your memory. But if you can't think of the other 300, then how are you going to make an, a reasonable investment decision regarding one of them? Well, you're not. They're just not even going to be uh, a potential investment candidate. And so that sort of availability works on a couple of different levels, and none of them are good for results. Are one of the things you're advocating is to invest in S&P stock solely? No. No? My <laughs> suggestion is some sort of broad-based investment product, whether it's an ETF that just tracks the S&P, that's a great strategy. Or an ETF that tracks all of the American stocks. That's also a great strategy. And Lisa, the benefit of those is that you don't have too much weight in a single name, but also those products are very, very, very inexpensive to the investor. And that's a huge portion of long-term results is how much money do you spend on your investment product? So any sort of broad-based, stock-based fund is generally a really good pick over time. And then I want to talk about what's to come, history and the future. I think uh, you and I spoke before we started this interview about the, the, the notion of a bumpy road ahead. And um, you said, and you've said it multiple times uh, on this episode about continuing to invest, 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 and keep investing. Are there a couple of takeaways or thought experiments that you can give our listeners to help them to stealth themselves and prepare for what's to come? That's a great question. And that's the flip side of the book. So I want people when they're when it's time for them to invest to 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 examine their biases and, and hopefully avoid some of them. As I point out in the book, the market is going to go down and sometimes it's going to be a sickening ride. Yeah. Or it's going to seem to be a sickening ride. But you're compensated for that. You're you're compensated over time for 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 putting up with that feeling, for remaining invested. And that's what I want people to think about when the market is down. For example, the market has had a really tough month. Well, think about the fact that if you have a 20-year or 25-year time frame, you will be compensated for the unease and the risk you are assuming today. Yeah. And so embrace it and realize that, yes, I'm, not in, uh, I'm investing, but I'm investing for 20 or 25 years. And then realize, you know what? I'm actually getting to buy stocks this month at a discount. So <laughs> I love that strategy. And we all love a sale. <laughs> precisely. And given that you're not gonna that you're not gonna need that money for, for some time, you know what? You're, you're buying at a discount. So it's a bit counterintuitive, you know, to lean in and buy when we have these opportunities to buy at a lower rate, stay in. I mean, if everybody sells, right, then that's not good either. Well, unfortunately. People tend to sell at the bottom and they tend to, to buy at the top. And I talk, there's, there's a fair amount of research in the, and the, the book is intended to be a fun read. And I think it is, I hope it is. But in the, in the very last quarter of it, I do crunch some numbers and I explain to people that when the market is doing really well, and I quantify this, when the market is doing really well, 
people buy more. Huh. Uh, and when the market is doing really poorly, and again, I use the example of February and March of 2009, when the market is doing really poorly, people sell or stop investing entirely. And which is just that it's human. Lisa, it's, it's, it's eminently human. It's not the best way to, to invest. And counterintuitive, right? Actually. Yeah, it, it is. It's, the market is not going to make things easy for you in the short term. The benefit is it's going to make things easier for you in the long term. Well, this is a good read, everyone. The Anxious Investor, Mastering the Mental Game of Investing. To learn more about Scott Nations and his work, please visit scottnations.com. You can find him on Twitter at Scott Nations. And Scott, this has been a fun conversation. I would love to come back and do more because financial stability, financial well-being is important to our happiness. We all we all know this and the research actually substantiates it. But, you know, we do know the facts that a hundred millionaire is not happier than the average person because we really just need our basic needs met as well. That's right. But you know, if we're if we're healthy and we're we're financially sound, yes. then it's it's so much easier to, for us to grow and improve our lives and have a, a positive outlook on, on the rest of our lives. So it's been a real pleasure for me, Lisa. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cybers Kamen on behalf of my guests, Michelle Singletary and Scott Nations, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.